Hello and welcome to a lecture on vaccines. I'd like to talk about how vaccines work in general and then later on talk about how what the landscape is on COVID vaccines as of April 2020. A vaccine is a killed or weakened version of an infectious agent that cannot cause disease by itself but it's able to stimulate the immune response. Typically a vaccine is injected into the arm of an individual and it's able to activate various immune cells. One of the immune cells it's able to activate is an antigen presenting cell. This cell takes up the vaccine, can chew it up into small pieces and present the small pieces of the vaccines in terms of peptides on molecules called HLA molecules or MHC molecules. And when it's presented, it attracts a subset of cells known as a helper T cell the helper T cell gets, recognizes this antigen presenting cell that's presenting a peptide and gets activated. This helper T cell then secretes cytokines or molecules that attract all kinds of other cells. One of the many cells it attracts is a B cell and a B cell then interacts with this helper T cell and then gets activated by itself. And as we've talked about before, a B cell is an antibody secreting factory. So it gets activated becomes a plasma cell and now starts secreting antibody molecules. And these antibody molecules are key to preventing reinfection or key for strong, long-lasting immunity. These antibody molecules recognize portions of the virus or pathogenic virus. So if you have a good vaccine and you've generated strong antibodies, these antibodies can attack or prevent of in, an infectious virus from coming in and infecting uninfected cells. So this is the humoral arm of the immune response. So the helper T, cells all, helper T cell also activates, activates other kinds of cells. These cells include killer T cells, and these killer T cells can get activated and perform multiple functions, including killing infected cells. These killer T cells also then become long-term memory killer T cells, or these helper T cells become memory T cells. So if you have a good vaccine, you will generate very good memory B cells, memory helper T cells, and memory killer T cells. So when you are exposed to an infectious pathogen, what happens is these memory T cells are now amped and reactivated much quicker than a naive T cell, and they can come in quickly and eliminate the pathogen. As of April 12, 2020, there are about 115 vaccine candidates. These vaccine candidates are in various stages of development, including exploratory, which are either confirmed or unconfirmed. And several vaccine candidates are already in preclinical trials or, or, or in phase one clinical trials. This is a table taken from a New England Journal of Medicine article talking about the technology behind many of the vaccine candidates, the attributes of these vaccine platforms, and the status of these vaccine candidates, what phase they are in currently. So there are a number of different technologies that are being used. A live attenuated vac vaccine really is a weakened version of the pathogen. While it's highly effective and likely to only take a single dose, a lot of care needs to be taken to make sure that this candidate does not cause disease by itself. There are a number of vaccines that are based on viral vectors, or vac viral vector vaccines, and the companies listed here are test different viral vectors based on their experience with certain viral vectors. These might be either replicating or non-replicating non viral vectors. They have certain advantages, which I will get into in the next slide. There are also protein subunit candidate vaccines. These are based on portions of certain proteins that are known to be immunogenic. And either academic labs or other industries are pursuing these sub protein subunit uh, vectors. They may not be as immunogenic as a live attenuated vaccine, but they are already on licensed platforms, which is an advantage, and they can be produced with relatively and they can be produced relatively quickly. The most novel platforms that are being tested are DNA or RNA-based platforms. Uh, these are likely not to be, be um, immunogenic in a single dose, 
and they're not in a licensed platform yet. But the speed at which they are being, they can be produced is um, a significant advantage. And the scale at which they can be produced is also quite a bit of an advantage. Here is a list of vaccines that are already in clinical trials in humans. As I'd mentioned, the DNA and RNA-based vaccine platforms are the most novel. Both of the clinical trials that are based on DNA and RNA vaccine platforms uh, are located in the United States. The RNA vaccine is being administered by Moderna. Uh, for, it has a significant advantage uh, as well as the DNA vaccine platform in terms of the fact that it can be made quickly. There's no requirement for large scale cultures or fermentation to produce batches of vaccine. Instead, they use synthetic processes. So in terms of the Moderna vaccine, from the time of concept to delivery, it was less than two months, two months which is unprecedented. These vaccines are in phase one clinical trials currently, and they are being evaluated or will be evaluated for the immunogenicity in the next few months. So the more traditional vaccines are based on viral vectors that are in clinical trials. Uh, the three vaccine trials that I'm going to briefly talk about are the technology is based on an adenovirus type 5 vector for two of these. It's, pr it's from the same company. Uh, the location where this is happening is in Wuhan, China. They're either in phase one and then soon in phase two clinical trials. And the question really is how immunogenic will, they, will these uh, adenovirus type 5 vector-based vaccines be? In the last week, there's been quite a bit of interest from the University of Oxford that's going to test its adenovirus vector-based vaccine for SARS coronavirus 2 starting mid-May. Uh, the advantage of this group is that they have a lot of experience using this vector for other uh, vaccine candidates. They also have uh, some experience because they've developed a related vaccine, uh, a vaccine for a related SARS virus known as the MERS coronavirus. And in their testing, this MERS coronavirus vac uh, vaccine appear to be safe in animals and early stage human testing. So this is a significant advantage. So this group is going to be testing over 500 people in England, I think, starting mid-May. And they hope to have large-scale amounts of these vaccines, if uh, ready, by early September, early October. So it's not really known yet how immunogenic they will be, but they are ramping up to do large-scale testing if results from their phase one slash phase two trials look positive and are encouraging. So there are a number of challenges with developing a safe and immunogenic vaccine, uh, specifically to SARS coronavirus 2. The spike protein on the surface of the virus is a promising immunogen and pretty much all of the uh, companies that are testing vaccine candidates are using the spike protein in some version uh, to determine whether they will protect against reinfection. Optimizing antigen design, however, is critical to ensure optimal immune responses. It's still not clear whether some of these vaccines need an adjuvant, something in addition to help um, boost the immune response, say for an attenuated vaccine or something that's an mRNA-based vaccine. Um, so debate still continues about the best approach. For example, also, some of the companies are using the full-length S protein. And that might be an advantage because then it could be a target for both antibodies and T cells. And uh, hopefully a good vaccine will induce both the humoral side and the cell mediated side in terms of, of generating good T and V cells. But many approaches or many vaccine candidates are only using the receptor binding domain of the S protein. In that case, the main target is only antibodies. And we don't know whether that's good enough. It might be, but that's still up in the air. Second, there's already preclinical pre experience with some vaccine candidates for SARS and MERS. It's not um, full blown, but really some of the concerns that have been raised have been that these candidates in animal models have actually made lung disease worse. So that is a consideration. Such an adverse effect is not useful and will not be successful if that's the candidate that's been chosen and it induces actually or makes symptoms worse. That's not helpful at all. And third, 
what we know now might be some correlates of protective immunity, and that comes from our experience with SARS and MERS vaccine. These are not yet established for SARS coronavirus 2. It's not known if this is going to be different for SARS coronavirus 2, how durable these immune, respo uh, immune responses will be, and whether a single dose vaccine will actually confer immunity or not. Finally, I think to end this lecture, I would like to point out that traditional vaccine development is a lengthy, expensive, multi-year project, process and a project. So you either decide you on a vaccine, it's extensively evaluated in animal models, then it goes into phase one, clinical trials, then 2A, 3 clinical trials, then licensure, and then full-scale manufacturing. What we're trying to do now is in this outbreak paradigm is overlapping all of these phases so they to shorten development time. So while you're testing already, you know, just in phase one, if you think there's potential for success, manufacturing development is also happening at the same stage. So this comes with a lot of collaboration between small companies, large companies, manufacturing facilities, clinical development um, protocols all happening at the same time at an unprecedented rate. Hopefully there will not be many mistakes, but likely when you try to speed things up, it there will be mistakes that happen. But we need to be careful and methodical and try to use the best possible vaccine for large scale administration. For long term efficacy or long term protection, vaccine is a vaccine, a safe vaccine, and an immunogenic vaccine is the best scenario. But in the interim, perhaps there will be therapeutics that will help uh, decrease severe symptoms in people who go on to get, you know, either reinfected or have new infections in the upcoming few months. Thanks again for your attention. This is Anuja Matthew, and this lecture was on vaccines. Um, if you uh, need any clarification, please feel free to leave comments below. Thank you.